I do want to talk to you about the crossroads of religion and politics in the United States. That's really the, the focus uh, of my book. But I did want to preface it by saying how much I uh, enjoyed uh, my experience at the University of Notre Dame. What a great uh, institution it was and such a, a quality education. I know from what I understand that now I probably couldn't get into Notre Dame because the standards have increased uh, so much. And really, it was very uh, meaningful f for me. I was really sort of steeped in uh, Catholicism, perhaps even more so uh, to some degree than others. I ended up uh, doing foreign study uh, in Ireland at Maynooth College. I think they still have uh, that program. And uh, I learned things in addition to my time at Brady's Pub uh, there in Ireland, but definitely learned a lot about uh, Catholicism while I was over there as well. And uh, then, as Mike mentioned, I uh, joined the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. I was about to go uh, into the Peace Corps, actually. And uh, then a priest uh, who was from Ireland uh, persuaded me and said, oh, you know, I'll sign you up uh, right off tomorrow and you can join the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And it was a great experience for which I was completely unqualified. I was a house parent at the age of 22 for some boys in very rural Alaska. Uh, in a what was then termed an Eskimo uh, community, a Native American uh, community, people who, the children and uh, young adults who were in trouble with the law, and I absolutely had zero qualifications to engage in that, but I learned a lot from the experience, and I will note that I'm really proud of it and proud of the work that we did, and in fact, it was a completely non proselytizing experience. It was uh, purely social service and really made me feel good. I had great professors here. One was a nun. Uh, who taught a New Testament course and was unrelenting uh, when she described the contradictions between the Gospels in a way that was actually stunning for me, as I, I forget if I was a junior or senior, but she did not hold back in terms of the historicity of the New Testament in a way that really informed my viewpoints, ironically coming from uh, a nun for uh, my, my later years. Now, Turning to what our focus is tonight, I want to preface it with the, the theory, the thesis, the possibility that there are people that have sex. I've heard about this. <laughs> I don't know anything about it myself, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm speculating, of course, and I haven't done any double blind studies to check into this. But I think there might be some data to support the theory that people do sometimes have sex, and in fact, that some people even enjoy it. I've, I've heard that as well, but since I was a Notre Dame undergraduate, I wouldn't didn't know anything about it at the time, you know, during my academic career. But there is data on this issue. Uh, in fact, recently, the Guttmacher Institute said, and I'm quoting, that virtually all sexually active Catholic women of childbearing age have violated the no contraception rule at one point or another, and that more than two-thirds self-report that they consistently uh, do so. Now, I, so, you know, uh, virtually all the data that they offered was 98% of women in that category, Catholic childbearing age women. Now, the Conference of Catholic Bishops responded uh, to that survey. They said, and I will quote them, if a survey found that 98% of people had lied, cheated on their taxes, or had sex outside of marriage, would the government claim it can force everyone to do that? Well, just respectfully, I would offer that uh, comparing uh, use of contraception to lying and tax cheats is maybe going a step too far. Uh, furthermore, that they did in this same study ask the sort of Jimi Hendrix uh, question, are you experienced, if you will? And what they found was that 70%, this is the women reporting themselves, 70% of unmarried Catholic women identified themselves as sexually experienced, and thus 98% of those uh, were ones who utilized uh, some form of contraception. Now, it could theoretically be, I'm sure it's not true of anyone in this room, but that perhaps there are people who have engaged in sexual activity with contraception. Again, that comparison to tax cheats and liars. For me, I would humbly suggest that women have life experience and that they have a life experience that is sometimes different than the life experience of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church.
and that uh, perhaps there should uh, be more credence given to the life of experience of women in that regard, and that perhaps that comparison to liars and tax cheats is a bit over the top and maybe inappropriate. Uh, but it is an area where the Catholic hierarchy today expressed itself with great vigor. For those of you who read the Washington Post or the New York Times and much of the media today, they said they are going to town on this issue of coverage of contraception. They promise a media, radio, television campaign. This is their big priority. They are instructing from the bishops down to the priests that there will be flyers handed out in the parishes throughout the United States on this issue. This is the issue that has their vigor. This is the issue that has their urgency. Of all the issues that you could pick, this is the one that gets the high priority. Now, I want to point out some interesting wrinkles about this possibility. Leaving aside, by the way, that there are 28 states now that have imposed this in some case for years, and the churches have been complying in 28 states already. But leaving that aside, think about this concept from the perspective of other religions, because as you all know, under our Constitution, you don't distinguish between the Catholic Church with its millions of members and other churches, including churches of four or five or ten, or, for example, the Church of Scientology, which must be treated equally under the law, and their belief that all forms of psychology, including psychological medication, as Tom Cruise has made clear, is something that they object to. So are you going to be able to say that when they run an institution, that they, cannot, they can be allowed because it's their religious principle to not provide that service? Or say you're one of the de denominations that believes in pure faith healing, as many do, thousands upon thousands do. Do they get to run an institution where they say, we will deny We'll have health insurance, but we'll deny procedures for, well, almost everything in terms of pure faith healing. But that is the logical consequence of that form of reasoning. I would submit to you that things are different here at the University of Notre Dame than when I was here. You know, we had, this may sound familiar for those with a recent memory, there was a national head of state, head of state of a country who was invited to speak at the University of Notre Dame uh, in my time, and uh, this head of state was pro-choice, and there was not a blink. You might be thinking of when Barack Obama was invited, and to the credit of Ted Hesburgh and others, there was those who spoke out, and Barack Obama did come here to speak, and I commend the university for that, but it was controversial. It was controversial because he was a prominent pro-choice head of state. But we had Pierre Trudeau, who some who know their history know he was the the uh, Prime Minister of Canada. And just to give you a sense of the difference in the situation, Pierre Trudeau, not only was he pro-choice, his wife, Margaret Trudeau, was at that time recently widely known for, uh, shall we say, uh, cavorting with members of the Rolling Stones. They lived a rather avant-garde lifestyle. Not a blink, not a blink of the eye. He was the keynote speaker at my graduation. The culture in American Catholicism has changed and changed in interesting fashion. One that I would suggest is questionable. You know, I, I write a chapter in my book about sex, because why not? Why not? No, that's not why. <laughs> no, I write a chapter in my book about sex because is there anyone more obsessed with sex than a religious right fundamentalist and their interest and willingness to impose their viewpoint on sex on you? through American law. The other day, Mike Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas and now talk show host, fundamentalist Protestant, said, quote, we are all Catholics now, referring to this contraception controversy. But I would suggest to you that maybe the opposite is what's happening. And that what you're seeing with the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, assuming the religious liberty argument, which has been the traditional religious liberty argument of fundamentalist Protestantism for about 20 years, now with the Catholic hierarchy, assuming that form of argument, that the Catholic hierarchy is aligning itself with fundamentalist Protestants in the United States of America today. And I'd suggest to you that this has important, and I would say ominous, implications for American politics uh, in this country. And that alliance includes, in many cases, as we saw with the proposition in California on marriage, a further alliance with the Mormon Church.
three big, powerful religious institutions working in concert off times. In my book, I have a chapter called The Fundamentalist 50. It's about sitting members of Congress who take theocratic positions on issues. And I use Fundamentalist 50 because I like the alliteration of Fundamentalist 50. I could have done Fundamentalist 100. I could have done Fundamentalist 150. When you look at the voting records and the attitudes of members of Congress, we're talking about 535 people who make decisions, make decisions for 300 million Americans. One example I will give you is Congressman Shimkus. Anybody know him? Anybody from Illinois? Congressman Shimkus. He's the one who made this statement in an official hearing of the United States House of Representatives regarding the seas rising as it relates to global warming. He said, well, you don't need to worry about the seas rising because in the Bible it says one flood, Noah's flood, that's it. We can dust our hands of that problem. Thank you, Representative Shimkus, for that bit uh, of enlightenment. And he is in alignment with one Senator Santorum and many others who identify as Catholic. It is an interesting history in this country. And I would submit to you that it's different, that it is different. You know, in my parents' time, there were some giants who walked on this earth. One giant was five foot six, and his name was Martin Luther King. And another giant was five foot nine, and his name was Robert Kennedy. And when Robert Kennedy, a Catholic, talked about morality, he wasn't talking about your naughty bits. He was talking about the underprivileged. He was talking about the poor. That's what Dr. King was talking about. That's what Bobby Kennedy was talking about. And I would submit to you that there's a fundamental change. But nowadays, we're hearing about the story of Noah in terms of American public policy. Well, when I went to Notre Dame, and I hope it's still true, that those kinds of stories were treated as metaphors, not as to be literally true, but so former Senator Santorum has been clear that he will advocate for the teaching of creationism in taxpayer-funded American public schools. That's not something you would hear from our prior generation of Catholic leaders, and I think it is ominous. Some of you may be familiar with Father Shanley out in the New England area. Father Shanley uh, is someone who had been known by then Bishop Daly to have made positive statements about something called the Man-Boy Love Association. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the Man-Boy Love Association is not a good thing. That's, sort of, that's just me. Uh, but what happened in the real world was that Shanley got transferred from Parish A to Parish B to Parish C, endangering children all along the way. And unfortunately, the attorneys for the Catholic Church in a number of instances, including the Bridgeport case that some of you may be familiar with, make the argument that the First Amendment free ex religious free expression clause allows them to keep secret internal decisions about the placement of employees, priests, when they are transferred in different parishes, endangering children along the way. I have to say to you, that to me, I remember in my home state of Maine, when from the parishes they handed out flyers. For what? To oppose gay marriage in the state of Maine. That was the big priority issue. Hand out flyers against gay marriage. That's, of course, that was active also in the state of California. I don't see how those two things can coexist. How can you be an organization simultaneously be saying, well, because of the religious free expression clause, we get to keep secret what's happening where we move people around who are suspected pedophiles. And by the way, we're going to make a big priority of opposing equal rights for gay people. To me, it's hard to fit those two things together. Mark Twain said, and I'm quoting, if there is a God, he is a malign thug. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to agree with Mark Twain, but I think we ought to hear the guy out. Here's something else that Mark Twain said. I cannot see how a man of any large degree of humorous perception can ever be religious. Now, I don't think that everybody has to agree with Mark Twain, but I do think that people like Mark Twain need to be included. They need to be included as part of the American tapestry. And one person that was adamant that they should be included was President John F. Kennedy 
the first Catholic president of the United States. President Kennedy, who famously said in his Houston speech in 1960 that, quote, America is where every man has the same right to attend or not attend the church of his choice. And Kennedy said that, quote, no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference. Contrast, contrast Jack Kennedy's policy views with what we've seen in recent decades. One example is the fundamentalist Golden Christian School in Ohio that had an entire curriculum based on watching videotapes while getting our tax dollars. Jack Kennedy was a Catholic who regularly attended uh, Mass on Sunday, maybe because of what was happening on Saturday night, I don't know. <laughs> but he was very clear about the separation of church and state. And that viewpoint, the viewpoint that I mentioned earlier, of people who talked about morality, people like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, people like Robert Kennedy. You know, the word morality has been stolen. It has been stolen and become a, a tool for attacking people about their private lives or sexual trivia. That's not what morality meant to these religious leaders, and I would argue that there is a secular set of values that is worth considering in our time. And when we return to the Catholic Church in the 21st century, I think it's at least fair to raise some questions. Recently, recently there was a debate about the issue of trafficking, human trafficking, and the Catholic Church has done some very commendable work with regard to help with human trafficking. However, they were adamant that they wanted to get government funds for those efforts. With regard to human trafficking, we're talking about 14,000 women. Actually, no, we're not talking about 14,000 women because a lot of them are girls. They're not women yet. 14,000 human beings, sex workers oft times, essentially 21st century slavery. But often, these women and girls are beaten. Often they are raped. Sometimes they become pregnant. Sometimes they contract HIV. The Catholic hierarchy is adamant to refuse reproductive health services, contraception and abortion services, even in the case of rape, but they want the government money as well. I would respectfully submit that with our tax money, that perhaps the more secular view is the wiser view. And indeed, I would use the word moral. I would submit to you that on a moral basis, the secular perspective on this issue is worth considering. Another example, the sexual abuse causation study that some of you may have heard about last year. Now, I for one am adamant from my experiences with priests here at the University of Notre Dame, I think it's unfair when people attack priests and you know label them all as pedophiles. I don't think that's accurate. I don't think it's right. I don't think people should do that. But nonetheless, this is a real issue. And for the victims, it's a lifelong issue. And it's one that needs to be faced squarely. And so this study was an important study, funded largely by the Catholic Church. And one thing they did, and I'm a former prosecutor, I'm a former child protective assistant attorney general. And in the legislature, I chaired a sex crime commission, and I worked on children's issues most particularly. So this issue is important uh, to me. And you know what that study did? They redefined pedophile. They changed the definition from age th uh, 13 to age 11 in their study. And you know what that meant? What it meant was that only 22 percent of priest abusers were defined as pedophile in that study, whereas if you went by what the DSM-4, what the professionals in psychology use as a definition, which is generally 13, then the number jumps to 73% from 22% by changing that over the course of two years. I would again use that word moral. If you were to say, what is the moral thing to do in taking responsibility for this issue, I would say that the Catholic higher he has to answer some questions. And you know what else they said in that study? And to me, it sounds almost humorous. But they essentially blamed the counterculture. I don't know, blamed the Beatles or something. They, they talked about what happened during the 60s era and the sexual revolution is somehow responsible for this scandal. If you th That sounds exaggerated, but read about it. You can read about the study, and that's what they asserted. 
Again, morally, I'd say that if you're talking about moral responsibility, that that study falls very, very far short of moral responsibility. And there seems to be a great intentness on this worldview. In 2010, a nun in Phoenix, who was administering St. Joseph's Hospital there in Phoenix, she signed off on an abortion for a woman under these circumstances. This woman had uh, life-threatening pulmonary hypertension. Her heart and lungs were in jeopardy. According to the doctors, ending the pregnancy was the way to save her life. And under those circumstances, the nun author authorized the abortion. What happened? The bishop demoted her automatically from her position and excommunicated her so that she was not eligible to receive the sacraments of the church. Now again, when you look at the issue of morality, I am proud to be a secular American. Uh, Bill Gates is a secular American. Brad Pitt is a secular American. Brad Pitt, who after the flood in New Orleans, keeps bringing his carpentry tools back time and again to the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. And one time that he's so popular in New Orleans that uh, they have all these signs around New Orleans that say Brad Pitt for mayor. And Brad Pitt said, well, I'm an atheist. I guess I can't be mayor. And I said, well, are you helping other people? He is. He's really continuing to go out of his way to help other people. And whatever you say about Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, who are not religious Americans, they're not extremists. One thing I'd say about those two guys, they're not extreme. They are reasonable, moderate people, and their viewpoint needs to be included. And so I would say to those who consider themselves Catholic now, who have questions, to consider the statement of Mike Huckabee, the fundamentalist Protestant, who said, we are all Catholics now. He's speaking on behalf of fundamentalist Protestantism. And with uh, Rick Santorum, speaking out, as perhaps now, if the polls are correct, maybe the most prominent uh, Catholic in America today, and what his viewpoint says. Why is he espousing that we should teach creationism in public schools? Using the religious liberty, the so-called, inaccurately called religious liberty argument, which is the exact legal framing, the exact political framing that fundamentalist Protestants have been using for 20 years. I'd suggest that raises questions about where we are with the Catholic Church and its interaction with American life today. I would submit that if the test is morality, shouldn't the health of women come first? Shouldn't the health of children come first? And this is a pervasive issue as I document in my book. I'm just going to give you a few examples of the laws, not someday, right now, that have religious bias in American law. Sobriety treatment. Religious programs usually get funding. Secular programs, which have been shown to be just as effective, don't. Religious bias in the United States military, primarily favoring fundamentalist Protestantism. Ch in children's law, I mentioned faith healing, child care, vaccines, corporal punishment, religious bias in law that sometimes threatens the health of children and those around them. Course access to reproductive health, sex education for our youth, replaced by religious propaganda. It's not right. Stem cell research, thwarted. Faith-based initiatives that discriminate. Vouchers funding schools that discriminate based on religion with your tax money. Of course, marriage discrimination, which I think is wrong. Uh, we talk about religious bias in land use planning. You'd be surprised, but there's religious bias in land use planning based on federal law. It's not right. Student loans funneled to creationist colleges. Creationist colleges where to be on the faculty in a biology department, you have to believe in young earth creationism to even get on the faculty with student loan tax money. Religious bias impeding your end of life autonomy. Loopholes to the sexism clause in Title IX to allow for sexism in some religious institutions. And major tax bias that helps enrich mega ministers with a parsonage exemption to have palatial homes. Really dramatic tax biases. Those are just a few examples. I saw that in my 10 years in office. Before I was majority whip, I was on uh, the Judiciary Committee and then the Appropriations Committee. So I was the type of person that I was in a position where I should be lobbied. And I was lobbied all the time by a huge variety of people. And the religious right, to their credit, was there all the time, lobbying on public policy issues. In 10 years, in elective office, I never once had someone say, listen, I'm with a secular group and I'd like you to vote our way on issues. And all I'm saying is that voice 
needs to be included in the discussion. And I saw increasingly the intertwining of these religious powers in a way that I think was retrograde and a danger uh, to the health and welfare of our fellow citizens. And so turning to the issues here on this campus, we have a secular group that applied for status. And I would say whether or not you belong to that secular group that applies for status on this campus, that it's reasonable, even if you are the most religious Catholic, it is reasonable to say, let them be included. There's a Muslim group that's accepted on this campus, and there should be. There's a Jewish group that's officially accepted on this campus, and there should be, absolutely. Equal with that, a secular group should be permitted. I'd further ask, what would happen, say, for example, if there's Asian students who come from a Buddhist background, which often does not believe in a, in a deity? Would their student group be rejected? Why? No. I'd say that just from what I've offered you here today, that secular people should be included on this campus and that members of the Democratic Club and members of all different student groups should say, no, we're going to include secular people as part of the debate and take a public stand in favor of that. And that's not because I have any hostility to saying, um, you know, let's keep the Bible out of any form of discussion. You know, if it's up to me, as I said, I, I learned about the Bible here at Notre Dame. It was a great education. And I'd go further than that. I'd say that in our taxpayer-funded public schools, they should teach the Bible. Sure. Taxpayer-funded public schools, they should teach the Koran. Absolutely. They should also teach the Constitution of the United States of America. And which of these documents evolves? Which changes over time? You know, America needs to be made safe the ideas of people like Einstein, and Darrow, and Twain. And politics, politics needs to be made safe for the ideas of people like Jefferson and Madison. We should follow two golden rules. First golden rule, do not to your neighbor what you would take ill from him. That may sound familiar, but I'm quoting the Greek philosopher Pittacus, who was several centuries before Christ. A second golden rule. Article 6, Section 3 of the Constitution, that our officials shall, quote, be bound to support the Constitution, but that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under these United States. The beauty of our Constitution was that it was designed based on a theory of evolution. With all due respect to the Bible and the Koran, they reject evolution, not just in a scientific sense, but in Santorum's Catholic Church, evolution is rejected in a sociological sense, in a humanistic sense. Blacks, women, gay people, sorry, your application was received 2,000 years too late. Too bad for you. Madison's genius was that he was humble. He was humble enough to know that what he knew in 1787 wasn't all there was to know and that things are going to change. You know, Darwin and Einstein, they wrote what I consider the real books of Revelation. They offered profound, new, elegant, marvelous ways of looking at our world in a truthful way. And just as dramatically... Just as importantly, James Madison offered a new way of looking at our world. You know, Einstein showed us that light bends, and Madison showed us that the light of justice bends. And I'm happy to report that I think the light of justice is bending in the right uh, direction. You know, of those who are age 65 and older, who report a naturalistic or scientific or secular worldview, they constitute about 7% of that 65 or older age range. But of those who are 30 and younger, that population is almost four times that much. The sociological trends are in that direction. And perhaps, just perhaps, there are people who identify as Catholic, who seek a compassionate worldview, who seek an inclusive worldview, and who might consider, who might look at a secular worldview and seek to at least study and analyze that worldview and consider it as a possibility. 
You know, the religious right has been lobbying for decades in Washington and every state legislature. They've been largely joined by the hierarchy of the Mormon church. And more recently, we've seen an alliance with the right within the Catholic church as well. This troika is new and it is disturbingly powerful from my perspective. Secular movement. A secular movement is relatively new, but justice and the trends are with us, and we need people with active leadership to get involved in a secular movement. You know, President uh, Jimmy Carter said that he's visited over 125 countries since he left the White House. And Jimmy Carter has observed that in those countries, the people, no, no government in position, the people have chosen John Lennon's song, Imagine, and they sing it. They sing it equally with their national anthems all around the world. People know the lyrics. They know the words to that song. And I'd say that Madison, who was a lawyer, and John Lennon, who was a poet, became increasingly focused in their lives on what Aeschylus said about taming the savageness of man and making gentle the life of this world. Imagine a new world anthem constitutes that vision, and Madison with his imagining of a future, gave us a structure for that vision. It was the vicious Joe McCarthy era that imposed upon us the phrase under God in the pledge. It is time to rejuvenate one nation under the Constitution. That is what we have always been. That is what we need to work toward. You know, someone who spoke on behalf of secular and free-thinking values was Helen Keller, who faced a challenge or two in her life. And she said that life is either a great adventure or it is nothing at all. What I offer from the secular perspective and from my 10 years of experience in elective office is that what matters is how we follow morality to compassion for our fellow citizens. And I think that the secular worldview has a lot to offer in service of morality and compassion. And I hope you would consider that view. And even if that viewpoint is not for you, I hope that you would make sure that that viewpoint is included everywhere you go here at Notre Dame and as you go into your careers. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have.